hope everybody had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. This is the first episode of 2022, and it's an extremely important one. Not my typical episode. He's a congressional candidate representing Tennessee, and if he wins, these are the type of people that have the potential to shape the country. So you might want to pay attention to this one. This is important stuff. Let's get right into it. Cheers. One more thing. I just want to say thank you guys for all the support. Thank you for being here. Love all you guys. Out. Robbie Starbuck, welcome to the show. Thank you. I love how it feels like an interrogation, you know, <laughs> kind of like this setup. It, it feels like, and I, I like it. I like it. I think that's a good environment to put people under. Every member running for Congress or in Congress should have to sit through one of these, except they should have to have truth serum before they do it. I'm totally down for that. Wouldn't that be great? I actually said this. I pitched this to a, a, lot, a lot of people, actually. I'm like, if you want to run for public office, what is the excuse for not wanting to answer questions after taking truth serum? Wouldn't that be a good barometer for running for public office? So yeah. like the people could ask like every question, the person just could not lie about it. Yeah. So you reminded me of that. <laughs> I would love to do it right here, right yeah. in this room. But um, so you're running for Congress representing Tennessee in 2022. You called yourself a political refugee from California uh, the first time we spoke on the phone. And after reading a little bit about you, I know you have a, a, a really successful production company. And I read that when you came out in 2015 and announced that you were a Republican, that you lost 85, I think it was 85% of your business. Yeah. Uh, sounded like pretty much overnight. And then you said um, that you thought that was the biggest sin. Uh, that your company would take or, or, or biggest hit. And then you endorsed Donald Trump. Yeah. And um, so anyways, <clears throat> what, what was the backlash literally overnight when you did that? Yeah, and I mean, it goes so far that, you know what, the business side, my wife and I, we did expect. Um, to be totally fair, we understood the environment in Hollywood. We knew it was gonna go that direction. Um, and it helps so much to have a wife who gets it and is 100% on the same page and is like on my team because there's a lot of spouses I don't think would would push you towards doing that. They would push you towards preserve our our well-being, preserve our status, you know, and all those things and she didn't care. I mean, she's from the south. She's like, "You have a duty to do this." You know, so she understood why it mattered so much to me because of my family's history in Cuba um, to do this. And that helped a lot. What upset me the most though, um, really the only thing that upset me was how my kids and wife were treated as a result. You know, that overnight scenario didn't just hurt my business. It was overnight with my kids too. People they had grown up with, um, where they were really good friends, sleepovers and they, every birthday and all that stuff, um, regularly hanging out with each other, full on ghosting by their parents the minute they found out that we were conservative. Wow. You know, and it was that quick because for them, their immediate reaction was we have to preserve our social status, you know, because these some of these people are celebrities and well known and stuff. And they that's what they want to do. They're concerned about their social status, not I know these people's hearts. These are good people. Their kids and my kids are close friends have grown up together. None of that matters. You know, this is all ideological, but in another way, as upsetting as that was, it was also freeing because every part of it, I think one of the most valuable lessons I learned was that a lot of people go through life thinking they have a certain number of friends and they never truly know who their friends are. I feel like I'm one of the luckiest people because I really found out who my friends were. And it's, it's a lot smaller of a group than most people think. Yeah. You know, the people that will show up for you, that will fight for you, that will stand by you that will take the hits. And I highly recommend it to people because I would much rather go through life with that tiny group of people who you know you guys ride together. You will always have their back. You'll always be there for their family. You know, if, if, if they died, God forbid, you would take care of their kid and make sure their kid got through college type of thing. I would much rather have that friend group than have 
thousands of friends who are never really your friends because they never got to know who you really are, you know? I, I'm right there with you, and I could totally relate to that. Uh, moving on to California. So California is like a whole other world uh, that, that I'm not familiar with, but I hear all about it. And I kind of I just want to pick your brain up. What, what was the final straw where you had just had it? You're done. I'm moving to Tennessee. I want to be... You know, it actually was not a specific final straw. It was more so a, my wife and I knew analytically for a very long time we wanted to move to the South. We wanted to move to Tennessee. I had worked in Tennessee directing some stuff and my wife had worked in Tennessee as a songwriter. And so we knew we loved Tennessee. I mean, and we had always known that. And it was kind of like our dream, you know, we're gonna have a farm in Tennessee and we're gonna end up raising our kids there. And um, so we knew that, but some things did develop along the way that confirmed for us that like you guys are doing the right thing. And not only the right thing at this point in our life, I would say that moving to Tennessee was the single best decision we ever made outside of getting married and having kids. Um, and you know, it's one of those things where you can almost try to pin it down to one thing, but it's a lot of different things. But if I had to pin it down, you know, there were moments like our son, um, he was in this Montessori school where it was a mix of ages, um, but the oldest was about first grade age. And there was a meeting at the school and they told us that um, this boy would be transitioning and becoming a girl and that you had to call them a certain name and all that stuff and that they were gonna be wearing girls clothes. And Did you say first grade? Yes, I did. And uh, my wife's sitting next to me and she's like, She's like, Robbie, what do you, don't do it. Don't, don't do it here. And I was like, I have to do it. <laughs> and I just, I, I spoke up and I was like, you know, I'm not to begrudge this, but I dug a little deeper with it and it was essentially like, where did this come from? You know, like, how did you know that your son wanted to be a girl, you know? And they said, well, it was a lot of different things, but him and his friend, you know, came in the room and it's these two moms are best friends, keep in mind, that are in this class. It's like they came in the room, they're wearing dresses and they're so happy, you know, and we just knew. And I was like, well, what were you guys doing though? And it turns out they were watching RuPaul's Drag Race. And so in my mind, immediately, I'm like connecting the dots. I'm like, obviously these kids saw moms give attention to this we're gonna go dress up as this. We come in, we get attention, we get validated. So then the moms do that. But it was a short time later, our son, um, cause he was leaving at the end of that quarter, we had had enough with all this. And he saw the boy crying and our son's very empathetic. And he tried to go up to the boy and essentially say like, hey, are you okay type thing. And he was crying cause he said he didn't wanna wear the clothes that his mom made him. And it just confirmed the pathology of all of this, of what's happening there. It's like this psychosis that's infected everything. And they've, I mean, I see this as, as blatant child abuse. Um, and it's, it doesn't stop there. I think what people don't understand is this isn't just infecting those very frontal things you see, it's infecting everything. And so everything about growing up in a place like that is poison. It's just toxicity all the time. Our oldest daughter, the school didn't notify us at a different school. They didn't notify us that we're gonna have a white privilege teacher come in and tell all the kids that they're white privileged and that you can't sit at lunch um, without a minority present anymore because it makes minorities not feel included. And my daughter came home and she's like, I don't really know what to make of this whole thing. And she explains it to me and I was like, well, you should ask them next time what they think you are. And she was like, what do you mean? And I was like, just ask them, ask them what they think you are. And um, you can teach them a lesson. You have the power to teach them a lesson because they're gonna say you're white and you can actually let them know that your family's Cuban and you actually have African in you and you have all these other things and that they need to learn that they're the ones creating the problem. They're the ones teaching kids to identify each other by their skin color instead of their character and their reality. And I find that whole thing so toxic. They're teaching kids to identify each other as oppressors or oppressed. And there's nothing more dangerous than that because what you're doing, I mean, they're, they're creating racial hierarchies and we're gonna see the effects of that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And what's really sad about it is it's entirely divorced from the original civil rights struggle. You know, it's entirely divorced from the ideas of Martin Luther King, entirely. And so, 
in a weird way, we've sort of become the champions. You know, I know we were going to talk about critical race theory. We've become the champions for Martin Luther King's dream of seeing each other by character instead of the color of each other's skin. But it's totality of all those things, seeing that poison everywhere. How, how long has this been going on? You know what's interesting? This actually happened, I would pinpoint it to a period of time a lot of people wouldn't think of, and it was about, I'd say, I, I want to, and I'd be, I may be off by a couple of years here, I want to say it was about 14 years ago, California started what was a rural healthcare initiative attaching healthcare to education. And that was the beginning of the end of parents having a say in the, in the education system. And essentially, once academia took over a parental role, it changed everything. Because I would identify public schools in California as essentially taking on a parent role. And they've completely obliterated parental rights. I just saw a video the other day, parents um, in a California county where they had actually been told by their daughter that the school had helped her transition into a boy without ever telling the parents. They were all calling her by a different name and a different pronoun and all this stuff. Parents had no clue until she had told them much later beyond they had already been giving her counseling and all this stuff during school hours that the parents had no clue about. And that's the role these schools are eking into because something that sounded nice in the beginning to people, oh, we're going to help people who don't have access to health care. Your average person hears that and they think nothing of it. But the reality is it was an opening to taking on parental rights. And that took on a whole different struggle in its own because it's given them license essentially to say, we can teach these kids anything. We know what's best for them, not their parents. And that's something we should see as equally dangerous in our own state because our own Secretary of Education here, she's actually pushing a rural health care initiative right now. This was also an access point for getting abortion into schools in California because that created that parent, or I'm sorry, the, um, the doctor-patient confidentiality and all that that they're treating as mature minors in California. Well, we have a mature minor law in Tennessee as well that says essentially after 12 minors can be mature enough to make their own medical decisions without their parents knowing. This is another thing I believe we have to get off the books because I think if you want to fix our, our problems in this country, a lot of them can be brought back to cultural problems. And if you want to fix our culture, you have to fix our families. And, you know, when you look at strong countries, they have strong families. They have strong identities. We don't have one anymore. We don't have strong families. We don't have a strong identity. But we do have permissiveness over time that's continued and gotten worse that breaks apart the family. That's permissiveness towards child rights, which is going to lead into a whole other area. I guarantee you this is going to end. You see right now the UN is already calling for child sexual rights. It's going to continue into a place where they normalize pedophilia even. Um, and you see this in the sexual health programs that they're launching in Africa. They're CSE programs that essentially, essentially are even teaching them that if you're HIV positive, positive, you don't have a duty to tell your partner. Really? Okay. So this stuff, it goes way further, but it starts at that permissiveness of taking away parental rights. How many people do you think are becoming more and more aware of this? Is it, does this all fall under that critical race theory? I mean, more people are waking up every day, but I'll, to give you an idea, for my wife and I, it's interesting because, you know, we had talked about this issue, um, started talking about it about six to seven years ago. And a lot of people come up to us now and are like, oh, thank you for talking about that. We, like, we've been talking about it. Like that, it's a long time period of waking people up, you know. And it is interesting. In California, we had some soft liberal friends, I'll call them, because they actually did believe in liberalism. I don't generally call people on the left liberal because they're not very liberal anymore. But these types of people were. They're like the soft liberals that believe in free speech. They believe in all that stuff, but they voted Democrat. Okay. At the time when we warned them about CSE in the schools, coming into the schools in California, and we warned them about critical race theory and all those things, they treated us like we were insane. They would never do this stuff. They would never teach that stuff in school, okay? I have gotten calls from every single one of our, our former acquaintances or former friends who said that stuff apologizing. Every single one has been affected by critical race theory or CSE now in their kids' schools. And so more people are waking up but it's a continued effort. This isn't going to stop until we make it stop. You know, until this gets banned. And you know, the other thing too that people have to keep in mind, um, 
corporate America has a responsibility here. A lot of people don't know this about a place like Cuba, and there's a reason we don't teach about communism in school. And that reason is if people really knew how communism came to be and how it worked, we would ne it would never be a discussion. We wouldn't have socialists of America, democratic socialists of America, none of this stuff would exist, okay? Because what people miss is the only way Castro got to power was corporations helped him, okay? Almost nobody knows that in America, that the corporations were behind him. Well, who's behind the left-wing woke ideologies pushing all this stuff? Who's behind doing a commercial where Santa kisses a guy? No. You know, did you see that commercial? No. It's a recent commercial. Um, and it's not that, you know, it's not even an attack on, on people who are gay. It's just like this is a cultural identity thing. No. Santa has never culturally been identified as a gay man. Mm -hmm. You know, even I have gay Republican friends who were like, this ad is... But it's horrible. Yeah. It's horrific for kids that like that's not the idea they have of Santa. Yeah. You know? And um all of this stuff though, until we as a group collectively say we've had enough of the corporations doing this and pushing this, and we're not gonna give companies who hate us our money anymore, it won't change the way it needs to. But I do think we're on the path there. But people have to recognize that these corporations do have a large part to play in this because they have essentially chosen the side because they think it's safer to be lined up to become oligarchs than they do to actually have to fight with each other in a free market. Because let me give you an example. In a true free system, Twitter, Facebook, and Google, and Amazon have to all compete with each other on multiple fronts, okay? And in the end, if you look out 100 years from now, theoretically, one or two of them should no longer exist, okay? But under a system like this Marxist technocracy that they're trying to build and that they've all essentially aligned themselves to, they all can have their peace and everybody survives. Mm -hmm. And they all get the importance, the status, the, the power. You know, that's what matters to them. So they've chosen that side for a reason because their survival... It works under that. They can do it. As long as the ruling party is on their side, they're gonna survive, they're gonna eat well. It doesn't really matter what happens to the rest of us. Same idea that they had in places like Cuba when this happened. And same thing that happened in places like Venezuela. The corporations were largely behind Chavez. And now, you know, with Maduro, because it's later on, they're not so much you know, on the same page, but they were in the beginning. Yeah. Before we move into uh, kind of the big tech stuff, <clears throat> Critical race theory. I saw a video you did on it, or a speech that you did on it on uh, on your YouTube channel, and you talked about where it came from, who kind of developed it. Can you go into a little bit of that? Yeah. So you know, there's a few chief architects. I think one of the most important to point out is the one who's most prominent right now, and that'd be Ibram Kendi, because Kendi's pushing this throughout every segment of culture. He's got a multi-million-dollar Netflix deal. He's at every university. Um, and to give you an idea of, I mean, I think I kind of already explained for those who don't mm -hmm. know, critical race theory is essentially putting these kids in those buckets of you're oppressed or you're an oppressor and that's that and here's the reasons why. And then the kids then see each other that way. Okay. Um, it's not just race though, right? It's not. It's not just race. So this is intrinsically tied to economic systems and to political systems. So um, throughout, you know, the stuff we saw last year, the riots and all that, that were very racial um, Ibram had this book that was just all over the country. I mean, it was a number one seller and it was in a lot of suburbia and it's called How to Be an Anti-Racist, okay? In the book, it explicitly says, and I think this is the line that should be attached to critical race theory forever, it says, you cannot be an anti-racist unless you are an anti-capitalist, okay? So that assigns a political system to that racial hierarchy and says that you can never not be racist unless you oppose capitalism. And that's what suburbia was taking in. That book is now pushed in every segment of academia, in our high schools and colleges, in every popular book club across America. It's, you know, you go into a Barnes and Noble and you go into racial justice or something like that. If a kid is so inclined to read about civil rights or whatever, that book is what's gonna be on the front. That's what's gonna be pushed on them. And those ideas, when you're most impressionable, let's say in college, they know the social dynamic college is like a really interesting case study because it's in a lot of ways designed similarly to a cult, you know? And I think that it is helping create this new identity for young people where we're seeing, you know, obviously the numbers of people 
who are attaching themselves to fringe ideologies are higher than they've ever been. And that has to do with the fact that they're being put in these social boxes that pressure them into accepting these ideas as normal. And that's a big part of the problem here. Why are they saying, what is being a capitalist have to do with being a, a so their argument essentially is that capitalism is intrinsically um, built to benefit white people and that unless you're uh, opposing it, you know, you're opposing the struggle for equality or equity actually is the term that, you, by the way, if you ever hear the term equity, run, run for the hills, run as far as you can. Equity is one of the like key words. So say your kid, you know, here's another problem. A lot of parents send their kids to private schools and they think I'm sending my kid to private school so they're not going to be hit with these issues. Well, wake up call. Look and see if your private school has a new DEI person working for the school. Diversity, equity, inclusion, okay? If they do, run for the hills. Your school is now taken over by Marxists. That's the only way you get a DEI person in. And sadly, when they started putting in DEI people, there were a lot of good people, good-hearted people who see it and they say, well, I want my school to be inclusive. I want my school to be diverse. I'm not opposed to those things. I'm a good person. And they don't see it's a front for these ideologies that oppose capitalism. It's a front for these ideologies that want to pit us into racial groups and want to make us hate each other. That's what it really is about. They want racial tension. They want racial struggle. They don't want us. The most dangerous thing for them is us all getting along. That is the single most dangerous thing to the elite in the world, to the globalists in the world, is all of us looking past our skin color and getting along and working together towards a movement that would serve the people. That's the most dangerous thing for them. Yeah. Well, where, where did this, where is this coming from and what's the end goal? Is it the government or is it Soros? Power. Is it globalist? Power. It's all about power. It's about power and control. You know, this is ultimately, you know, the struggle of humanity. You know, from the beginning of time, everything's about power and control. Yeah. Everything always has been. I think that even if you're fighting for good, it ultimately still is about power and control. Even if you're fighting for, let's say, God's mission, okay? Because I really feel like I would not be running for Congress if I didn't feel like I was called by, by God to do this because um, I don't want to. And I think, honestly, if you wake up in life and you're like, your whole life dream is to run for Congress and, and have power over people, you're probably a little bit of a sociopath. Um, that was not my life dream. It was like, it was more of a, a like, we have to do this. You know, um, and even if you're of that mindset, the truth is it's about power and control for different reasons. It's about power and control for the people for me. I want people to be in control again. Our founders wanted that power and control. They didn't want the king to have that power and control. They wanted the people to. And so ultimately it all goes back to those things. The reality is though is a certain subset of people understand they can only get that power and control through means that are going to hurt normal people. You know, because they fundamentally do disagree with us on a number of things, and we can't get past that. And so when they build that out, they say, okay, well, these are broadly popular things though, so how do we get people there? Well, you have to create chaos. That's, what, that's a hallmark of, let's say, Soros. Everything Soros does is about creating chaos because he makes money from devaluing uh, currencies, okay? To devalue currencies, you have to create chaos within the country. And then beyond that, if you want power, you want to elect people in those countries that would normally not be electable. You have to create chaos with the people who would be electable, mm. which is what they did over these past few years. To change the identity of a country, you have to go even more local and smaller than that. So that's where Soros got the plan to go and invest in DA races. These district attorney races, by the way, in the past were five figure races. You know, they were not these huge events. They were, you know, maybe $30,000 or $50,000 for a campaign budget or something, you know, maybe 100,000. Soros is dropping millions into these races and electing absolute radicals. You know, um, the people, in, ironically, the most famous prosecutors in our country are pretty much all Soros prosecutors, okay? Kim Fox in Chicago, she was responsible for not prosecuting Jesse Smollett, okay? And they had to name an independent prosecutor. She was also in collusion with people like Kamala Harris and Michelle Obama talking to them about what a great person Jesse is mm -hmm. and ultimately refused to prosecute for political reasons. Thank God we got somebody in there who ended up independently prosecuting the case and proving what he did was done to create racial tension. It was done again 
to create that racial strife that they want. They want the chaos. Yeah. You know, and then you look at a place like St. Louis, Gardner, that's another Soros DA. She charged the McCloskey family who protected their home when their home was assaulted by rioters. Yeah. And she charged them. You look at places like Larry Krasner, Philadelphia, all these places in the country, common theme, chaos, the looting, the laws saying we don't prosecute people who shoplift under $950. We don't, basically, essentially, we don't actually prosecute illegal things anymore. Releasing people, even child molesters from prison during COVID under the auspice that this is about health. We have to free these people because it's so dangerous. Like, I'm sorry. Anybody of a sound mind in America, if you said, hey, are you worried about a child molester in prison possibly getting COVID? If there's anybody in the, in the world who's saying yes to that question, I have questions for them, you know, because you're not of sound mind. Somebody of sound mind would not be worried about that. Yeah. I, I was watching another interview and it also, just to reiterate on the DAs uh, that Soros is funding, it seemed like all of them, uh, and there was a ton of cities listed, I think you were on Tucker, and that's where yep. they were talking about it. All of these cities where these DAs are becoming elected, they're beating the prior murder, uh, the, their murder records. Oh, so, okay. This is a number everybody in America should know. Everybody, okay? Past 12 months, murders have risen by 30%, okay? If you're not familiar with crime statistics, you might go, oh, that doesn't seem wild, right? I mean, it seems like semi. The next closest is 12.7% for a 12-month period in history. And that was the year Martin Luther King Jr. was, was killed. Wow. And so a large segment of that unrest and the added murders and everything was apparently, you know, a lot of historians have associated it to the unrest that happened because of his assassination, which obviously is a huge cultural moment, but that divide between 12.7% and a 30% rise, that is massive. And what you would expect is normally during a crime rise, if it's associated to a significant singular event, is that it would shoot up and then shoot down. That's not what's happening. It's going up and up and up and up. It's still rising right now. Yeah. And this is not just happening in big cities. This is bleeding out to the places outside of the big cities. And I do think that, you know, some people have asked me, what do you think the big issues of 2022 are going to be when you get near election day? I think um, crime is one of the top three. I think that the economy and freedom generally when it comes to things like mandates and things along those lines and then crime are the three big issues. Those are the three that are going to drive people to get there. Critical race theory is, and education is right there. It's like if you had to do a 1A, 1B thing. Um, but those are the issues that are gonna drive people out. Well, moving into that, I got another question for you. And there's just so much going on in the country that's gonna fundamentally change just everyday life, especially for our kids. And you know everything from open borders, critical race theory, um, no term limits on politicians, which there never has been, uh, the, the rise in crime. There's just all these things, the freedom, COVID, back vaccine mandates, everything. What do you think that the biggest threat is to the United States inside of its borders is to include, to include the Southern border? Hey guys, let me tell you about this subscription service that I've been working real hard on called Vigilance Elite Patreon. Basically on Patreon, we have it broken up into three different tiers. We got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Let's dive in. Our tier one patrons get all the behind the scenes footage of the Sean Ryan show. That could include behind the scenes photos. That could be side conversations that we have in between breaks. That could be specific questions that our patrons give us for the guest on the Sean Ryan show. And a ton of bonus content that doesn't really fit into any specific category. For our tier two patrons, they get access to our tactical training library, which consists of well over a hundred videos. We've broken those videos up into separate categories, and those categories are rifle fundamentals, pistol fundamentals, drills, tactics, driving, gear and weapon setups, and everybody's favorite mindset. Also on tier two, you will get a live update from me on the first and the 15th of every month where we talk about the upcoming guests on the Sean Ryan show. Plus 
all the benefits of Tier 1. Our top tier, which is Tier 3, gets full access to all the other tiers, plus they get full access to me, where we do video teleconferencing, VTC, once a month. We discuss anything from tactics to current events to who's coming on the show. I take suggestions and it's very interactive. No matter what tier you choose, the support is greatly appreciated and it is the only thing that makes this show drive on. So thank you for all the support. See you on Patreon. The Democratic Party. The Democratic Party as a yes. whole? As a whole. Um, not necessarily its voters, because there are some good people who vote Democrat that just are, they don't understand the reality of where the party's going. In total, all the things you described, those are all because of the existence of the current far left Democratic Party. They're no longer a liberal party. I try to drive that home to people all the time. Um, and if you don't believe me, look up the word liberal. And you're going to quickly find out it does not describe them. They are not liberal. These are left-wing authoritarian fascists. They want total control over our lives, over everything. And unless they get that, they will keep pushing and pushing. And even once they get it, they won't be satisfied. Communists are never satisfied. Marxists are never satisfied. Authoritarians are never satisfied. Because they're always looking over their shoulder. They're always trying to figure out, because they stepped on so many people along the way to get there, who's coming for me? I have to get more control, yeah. more authority. And that's what will continue as a product of what they're doing now. So that's the most dangerous internally. And I don't see that changing unless the American people send a message in the following couple of elections to make it very clear that America is not going to be and does not want to be a socialist or a communist country. Yeah. Do you think that that's possible? I yes. Mean, because Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, those are all, I mean, that's, that's what people see. Yep. The news networks. They're, they're going to be working against us. Absolutely. No question. And they, it's about their survival again. Because they know that if we take the majority and a group of people like me, our lawmakers, they are not going to end up in a good position. I don't want to do hearings. We've had enough hearings. Mm -hmm. Americans are sick of hearings. They want action. They want somebody who's willing to go in there and just absolutely do whatever's necessary to get the job done. And these companies, you know, we talked about capitalism earlier. And what's interesting is a lot of people who kind of, they don't know a lot about politics, but they become soft socialists as young, you know, high school, college age. A lot of it's predicated off of stories they hear about Amazon, actually, where they go like, Amazon's such a horrible company. Look how they treat their workers. Yeah, Amazon is a horrible company. They treat their workers like dirt. These guys are in their trucks like 20 hours a day, men and women, and are literally peeing in bottles, you know, to get their job done. They're hard workers, absolutely, but Amazon is abusing them, no mm. doubt. But how did Amazon get here? How did Amazon get the power that they have? Because it actually was not capital capitalism. It was a perversion of capitalism. Capitalism in its purest sense would have never allowed something like Amazon to exist because in a capitalist market, you need to turn a profit within a certain time period or you're just not gonna survive. Amazon had a totally different approach to it. They said, look, if we run a loss for X amount of years, we're gonna be able to gain X market share. If we have this giant market share as a result of that loss, but power, because they were able to grow as they do this, we're gonna be able to kill enough small businesses along the way where we'll have no competition, okay? This whole strategy violates every anti-competitive law in America, every antitrust law in America, but nobody at Department of Justice ever went after them. That's a reason why when you hear Amazon didn't pay their taxes, they didn't pay their taxes because they ran at a loss on purpose for so long. This is all by design. Yeah. And so a company like that theoretically in capitalism should not exist because they went beyond the scope of pure capitalism and they went to essentially what I would describe as fraud. It's, it's a crime. Is it too late to break that up? It's not too late. You can still do it. You can still do it right now. You'll still be able to for the next 10 years. And so we need 
to have the people in there who are willing to do what is necessary to do that. And, you know, so the question about can we do this? Are we going to have a chance of winning to the degree we need to to be able to do that? This is why powerful people hate the internet so much and why you see such a push to censor the internet because we do have a chance and it's because of open access on the internet. And while big tech is trying to censor us, they've done it to me, they've suspended me, they've done all types of things, they just can't quite shut us up. You know, yeah. there's all these other avenues online opening up and you may lose access to a certain group of people, but in general, we're able to reach enough people still to be able to win these elections. That's with all, think about this, with all of the rigging that they've done, with all of the algorithms and the exposure to information that the powers that be want people to see, the choosing of what narrative you'll see, every news channel aside from two in existence, parroting their lines, their narrative. Still, we're not just competitive, but we won an election recently for president, okay? Yeah. That's with Google having the ability by itself, just Google, of flipping millions of votes on their own just yeah. through their search results that they show people. That by itself should tell people everything. Our ideas are broadly popular with people. And if given equal footing, we will dominate. We will dominate in every facet. Like, I think a lot of people lose faith because they don't see, they, they lose faith in conservatives because they don't, they, it's, it's hard to find information. Yeah. You know? And um, we, <laughs> they need another avenue immediately. Absolutely, and I think that's a real problem. You know, I'm excited to see what Truth Social does because, um, you know, Trump being behind it will add a gravity in terms of the number of users who sign up, I think. And I think it will lead to some people who hate Trump signing up too because they just want to see what's going on, mm -hmm. which builds you a number of people necessary to make it a real competitor. And I think that that is going to be a positive for the marketplace of ideas because suddenly the big tech companies are going to have to face the fact that they're not in collusion with this other option people have. Because right now it's fairly easy for them. Facebook and Twitter, they work in conjunction with each other on banning people on a regular basis and YouTube, you know, as part of Google. Um, they do it all together. So, you know, it's happened to a number of people I know where one day they wake up, they're banned by Twitter, and a couple hours later they're banned by Instagram, a couple hours later their YouTube shut down. And they all work together. But now that they have this outside competitor, you know, and they're working with Rumble, so Rumble and Truth Social will have their own different, you know, deal if they build this out the right way and the servers and everything there's not issues in the beginning which is something that they need to make a priority is make sure everything is just running beautifully they have a real chance to create a real competitor because once you're not able to collude with a company you don't know what's coming and you also have to start questioning your own actions hey are we going to lose our market share on advertising because of the decision we're about to make. They have to think those things through and suddenly the companies that are all in collusion together have to start thinking independently of themselves too because suddenly they all have to worry about an outside competitor. So I'm excited to see what Truth Social does but I do think that to really fix this problem we do need an internet bill of rights for the people and that's something I'm gonna be releasing soon which is a, a new contract for America that essentially is a list of, of our promise to the American people about the priorities that we'll have. And one of those is an internet bill of rights that guarantees our ability to exercise free speech in the public square and recognizes that the public square is now places on social media and that that public square is a necessity not just for your liberties to be exercised but also for your livelihood. I know a lot of people who you know in um, wildfires they didn't go to the news for information they went to Twitter they went to Facebook because they had quicker access to information that they needed life-saving information for let's say like um, I actually know somebody that's happened to where their horses needed to be saved in a wildfire and they weren't there. They used social media to be able to get a stranger they didn't know to save their horses. Okay. Oh, okay. That that ability of connectivity 
I feel like is something that um, it has a practice and purpose beyond just access for your free speech, but also your access to public safety information. Because uh, LA Fire Department or Nashville PD, they're giving information faster many times on social media than they are through traditional news. So once a company bans somebody from their ability to access that, they're now affecting the ability to get public information. That's a damn you know? good point. And so all of those things need to be fixed too. That's a damn good point. Didn't Apple just shut down? Did, didn't Apple come out and say that they're not going to host uh, the app for Truth? I don't know about that. I haven't heard that. But if they do say that, they're going to have major uh, legal issues. And that will end up in, in um, Truth Social's favor because it's very clear-cut law on anti-competitive behavior. And um, because they run an app store that is exclusive to their phone and they don't allow their phones to download a secondary app store, it's, uh, it's what the law is already defined as anti-competitive behavior. And so it'll just take some time, but it'll end up at the Supreme Court and it'll very quickly um, end up in, in truth favors or, or truth socials favor. Okay. Moving on, external threats to the U.S. So we have China. We just pulled out of Afghanistan and uh, gave Taliban complete power. Uh, Taiwan's... Uh, you on the know, precipice of disaster. Exactly. Ukraine, Russia, uh, the border, and all the cartel stuff that's going on down there that are coming across. Uh, what do you think that the biggest external threat to the U.S. is right now? It's China, no question, but I will mention one thing for people. Um, to recognize our own failures on foreign policy. It took us four presidents, trillions of dollars, and millions of lives affected for us to take Afghanistan from being under control of the Taliban to being under control of the Taliban. Yeah. We have no business in these countries, and how many young men did we send to die? A lot. Way too many. One was too many. We have no business there. Culturally, the fact that our political class couldn't identify that this was a place where they did not want to be a democracy like ours. They did not want freedom like ours. It says a lot about their ability to make good decisions. And it's why I think we need normal people in office again, because we're not divorced from these realities. These are, these are about things uh, of, you know, sort of political correctness. The people in D.C. don't want to admit that the culture in Afghanistan is very different from the culture in the U.S. They don't want to admit that the way that they treat their women is very different than we are here. They don't want to admit the permissiveness of pedophilia in a place like Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't I'll, think we ever should have been there at I, all. I, I think we should have stay out, stayed out of it. I was always on the train of Rand Paul and Ron Paul. We had we had no business there, and we had to protect our people. What we should have done is send in our people to kill the people responsible for anything that happened in the U.S. Targeted teams, not democracy making, not nation building. Okay. You know, so like we have a responsibility to protect our people, safety of our country, absolutely. But you know we can do that much more effectively with really strong, well-trained teams of our very best people. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. We went there to nation build. We went there for a myriad of economic reasons, for control reasons, for power reasons, and for flexing reasons. And in the end, we ended up embarrassing ourselves as a country. You know, We lost that veneer of strength that we had for so long. We had a veneer of strength, nobody wants to mess with America and we lost it entirely through what we did there. You don't think we maybe we should have kept a couple of bases open because of China and well, Afghanistan? Well, so once we were there, yes. You know, now that we're there, calculus changes. We needed to keep Bagram, you know, I think is, is a big one. We needed to keep that. It was a strategic base. It, it kept, you know, a lot of um, things at bay because China is essentially in control of, of Afghanistan now. Um, and that is going to be a channel for them to take control of other parts of, of the world. They're also in control of all of Africa, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, this is going to turn into a major issue. And it's why I said China's number one, because China doesn't hide from the fact that their goal is domination, including of the United States of America. They don't hide it. They have a hundred year plan. They're dedicated to it. They're astute. They're smart. They're stronger year over year. They're ruthless. This is a group of people that are, you know, essentially, at the very least, if I was giving them a compliment, it would be that they're nationalists in a certain sense, that they believe in the Chinese well-being of their country and their party above all else. Not so much their people, but of their, their country and their party. 
and that results in them being willing to do whatever is necessary for that. And so in that respect, in terms of, you know, if you're looking at it like a war, you know, they're dedicated to doing whatever is necessary. They're not worried about what's going to be popular in the news. You know, um, recently there was a story where China essentially said that they're cracking down on the feminization of men. Okay. Um, in the U.S., people were like, that's so bad, that's so mean. And they're like, no, we identify that in the military we're going to have a problem if we don't do that. In the U.S. now instead, we're saying, how do we be more inclusive? Let's change our entry standards. Let's change our training standards so we can be more inclusive of more feminized males. Yeah. You know, where do we think that's going in 20 years? You know, not good places. It's not going good places. And it's like... Some people don't want to talk about this because they're like, oh, I'm going to sound mean or I'm going to sound... It's, there's nothing mean about the reality of war except for the reality of war. Like, if you don't talk about it, what's going to be mean is what happens in 20 years. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be another ground war, but... I pray I you're right. I think it's going to be a lot of tech. I pray Even you're right. Even just from the time when I was at war to, to the end of my career, the tech has completely... They, they've taken over so much... Uh, so much of, of every aspect of what goes on and, and more and, and it's just advancing it well this is the frustration i actually had when we were at war is that we had a lot of technology we didn't use that we didn't empower our soldiers with that we didn't give them to protect themselves there's so many people who died unnecessarily because they weren't given the technology despite the mass trillions of dollars that we were spending that money wasn't always protecting our, our soldiers That's that true. wasn't the priority that's true. You know, and yeah. that'll always bother me. But I, I pray you're right about a ground war because if anybody would be willing to go do a ground war, it's China. Russia, on the flip side, you know, I'm not as concerned about um, Russia long term. Their economy is nowhere near China's. Um, their actual global power is nowhere near that. In fact, I think we do Russia a favor by treating them the way that we treat them. We treat them beyond um, the power that we should. We treat them as if they have power that they don't, that they really don't in reality. You know, if you look at their, their stretch, I mean, they're a big country, most mm -hmm. of it's ice, you know, and people never recognize that. Like, this is not a gigantic place. California has a higher GDP, you know. Um, it's, it's interesting from that standpoint that we give them the power that we do. Now, in terms of, you know, threats, I think we have to be realistic and look at, you know, Russia is also threatened by some things we do. You know, like if we put ships out in the Black Sea, we have to imagine how would we feel, too, if Russia was putting ships outside of Florida. Yeah. You know, so the fact that they are in that tit for tat for us shouldn't be surprising to people. I mean, we're doing something that if was it was being done to us, we would be upset about. Um, and so from that aspect, I'm not really so much worried about them. I think that there's somebody we have to keep an eye on, but China is the one we have to worry about. In your opinion, what do we do if China takes Taiwan? Do we step in? I think that we have a duty to step in, but I don't, you know, it's so weird because a president really defines a lot of what we should do. And with Joe Biden in office, I'm afraid of us doing something because we're going to do it poorly, we're going to be weak, and we're going to get dominated. And it's going to expose our weaknesses even further. I feel like Taiwan is quickly becoming like the Israel. Yeah. Of, uh, if Trump was president, I'd have no question about what we had to do. Um, because the strength and the um, unpredictability adds so many things to us. You know, Millie wouldn't be there if Trump was president right now. Millie would be gone. Mm -hmm. And so Millie's another person I worry about because that's a man who's not interested in winning a war. It's a man who's interested in power and interested in being, you know, um, socially accepted. And that's the wrong place to be leading an army, leading soldiers, you know. Um, so I'm worried about that. But I do think that with the right circumstances, we do have a duty because... Um, Taiwan is an independent people and it's sort of like, you know, if we really mean it, you know, a lot of people say never again, okay, uh, with the Holocaust. If you mean that, you need to recognize that China is doing that right now. Mm -hmm. They have concentration camps of the Uyghurs. You know, their incursion into Taiwan would be essentially creating 
concentration camps of no question of Taiwanese people who resisted um, and who just want their freedom. And so we do have to ask that question. You know, there's a difference between a country changing fundamentally because of elections. You know, if you elect a communist leadership group, it's a very different prospect than China invades and forces you to lose your freedom. And if that was being done to us or, um, you know, to our friends that we're really close with, we would fight for them um, because we would want them to fight for us. And so we do have to do something. I just fear it happening under Biden. And I think it's the perfect circumstance for China to go after Taiwan is with Biden as president. And they know that. So I think they, if I was a betting man, I would bet on them going and invading Taiwan at some point while he's president. Yeah, I'll bet you're right. I hope to God that doesn't happen. Me but, too. Um, so I want to start wrapping things up, but a 2024 presidential run by Trump, is that what's best for the United States? Yes, 100%. 100%. 100%. That's what's best. Um, Trump has unfinished business. He has a great team of people that, um, you know, I believe that term would be the most effective term of a president in history because the team that he has assembled now that was ready to go in for a second term are people who are there to get the job done. They're not there to sell books or any of the, you know, all the, the glitz and glamour of, of, you know, that political world. These are, these are doers. These are people who are ideological warriors and are there for the right reasons. Um, so I do think it's what's best. Also, if you talk about it just from a political standpoint, politically, if it's anybody aside from Trump, and Trump is also running, you're talking about us fighting a war within our own party then, instead of fighting a common enemy. Whereas Trump has the base, he has the rallies, he has the crowds, he has the energy. He also has regret, you know, the regret of the people who wish they had voted for him now when they fill up the gas in their cars. The people who are like, you know what, the mean tweets were not so bad. <laughs> you know, they're like, I'll take the mean tweets again. Um, the reality is I think some people are learning too that sometimes things they didn't like were useful, like those mean tweets. Because um, you look at oil, if you're mad when your gas you know, tank is two times more than it was last year, you got to think about those mean tweets because who controls gas prices? OPEC does. They control oil. OPEC was afraid of Trump. Trump tweeted at them, did mean tweets at them, scared the leadership of OPEC. And OPEC ultimately was like, this dude's crazy. We don't know what he's going to do. We're, we're, not touch, we're, not, we're not touching it. We're not going after him and pissing him off. Okay, That is a good thing. That resulted in good things for you. It gave you that $2 gas. You know, So you may not like it in a country club, but in reality, it was effective and got the job done, okay? Um, so there's a lot of people who are recognizing things that they thought they didn't like are not so bad now, you know? And they're like, actually, I would be a lot happier with Trump as president right now. You know, not only can he actually uh, put together a coherent thought, he can read a teleprompter unlike our current president, but he can actually ignite respect from world leaders in a way that Biden's not able to. If he doesn't run, who would you like to see on that ballot? DeSantis. DeSantis and? As his vice president, I would say, um, actually, I'm going to go with an outside the box pick here. Um, I would love to see Candace Owens as VP um, in either a second Trump term or a DeSantis term because um, she's outside the box. She's fierce. She uh, breaks a lot of the Democrats' um, leading arguments against our party. Uh, she puts up with no BS and she knows her stuff. She knows policy. She knows numbers. She is somebody no Democrat wants to debate. And I feel like she would be a strong face for the party and a strong wingman for a strong president and eventually maybe a president herself. Do you think she would be open to that? I do. I think she would be. I mean, I'm not speaking for her. I am friends with her. I've never talked to her about this. <laughs> um, so I don't want anybody to think that who are like, I know Robbie and her are friends. You know, I've never talked to her about this. Um, but it's something that I've thought for a long time that, you know, I, th I think that she would be. You That's know. an interesting pick. Yeah. Really Very outside the box. Yeah. If it wasn't her, though, then um, I think you have to look at... Um, I think you've got to look outside the political class. I think you do have to look at an outsider because I think people are sick of politicians. Yeah, I do too. Uh, I did forget one question before we do wrap up. I think one of the biggest threats that we face inside the U.S. is career politicians. 
So are you for term limits? Absolutely. How are we going to get term limits? You have to have a constitutional convention because the Supreme Court uh, made it very clear that we can't do it just by simply legislating. You have to have a constitutional convention and actually make this a part of our constitution. Um, But I'm 100% a believer in them. I think that this is at the core of a lot of our problems in America, that we have a class of people that are divorced from reality of everyday people. And um, they're essentially just a DC bubble. You know, they do whatever in the DC bubble is popular and wanted and, you know, they don't really care enough about what's happening in the country or about preserving our country. So I 100% agree with you. I think we need term limits. And one way I've thought about it, because there's one way to do it where if you did that convention and you made it possible, um, then Congress would have to pass a law after that saying this is how it works. And in that sort of scenario, you would still have a lot of trouble getting people to agree to it. But I think the one way you could make it happen is by grandfathering people. So you'd say, look, if you're in Congress now, you're grandfathered from this, but starting the next person after you, there's term limits. Because unfortunately, their own personal interests are going to outweigh you know, that belief that we need term limits. But the minute you say, don't worry, you're okay. You can stay as long as you want. They'll be, okay, well, at least we get it started. You know, at least we get that, that, that started in the interim. But I think that those are the ways that we can realistically get there. It's going to take time though. Yeah. That's a great, I I didn't think of that. That I think that might actually work. Yep. I hope it does. I hope so too. (laughs) Damn. But well, what's next for you? We're running this race. So, you know, just building up support and doing everything that's necessary to win. You know, it's um, a lot of people don't realize it's a lot of work to run for Congress. It really is like I am out there all over the place every day. There's a lot of driving involved. I have to go to D.C. too because there's a D.C. primary at the same time that there's a primary here where you have to win over certain people in D.C. so that they'll do what's necessary to support you there or to keep other people out of your race from messing with you, you know, type thing. So there's there's all that you got to run with too, but you also have to really get in touch with the people. And name ID is the biggest thing in any political race. So you have to be all over the place and make sure that you're meeting people. They know your name, they know what you're doing, and they know where your heart is. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work. And um, fundraising is big. So fundraising is a huge thing for us because we're fighting not just the Democratic Party, not just the Democratic Socialists of America, not just the communists, but we're also fighting the establishment class in the US, the Mitt Romney, corporate raider-esque rhinos. And to do that, that means there's a lot of money against us. And I'm also turning down money from all these woke corporation packs who try to buy your votes by giving you money. So because I'm doing that, my campaign's fully funded by the people. And so we're pushing, you know, in-person fundraisers, events and things along those lines and raising money online because I want to be accountable to people. And I think that is the future of politics is, is we need to recreate that message that we are accountable to our voters, not to Walmart, not to Amazon, you know, not to any of these entities, but to the people in the actual district that we're supposed to represent. So um, that's the big thing for us is just every day you build, you build, you build. Um, I watched this thing recently that talked about how important practice is. And it was like the problem in, in a lot of people's mindsets is that they look at practice a specific way where they get to practice, if we think of it as a sports analogy, they go in and say you have to do push-ups. The whole time they're thinking about when they get to, if it's you have to do 25, they're thinking about when do I get to 25. They're not thinking about how do I become the best. They're not thinking about I can push beyond 25. They're looking for the end. They're looking for a result instead of just searching out greatness. And to search out greatness and to do your best and to win a race like this, we're not just going through the motions of, we need to reach 17,500 people with X. We're saying, how many people can we reach beyond that? How can we set a record? How can we go beyond the normal political machine and run this differently? You know, So that's sort of our priority list is thinking outside the box and running the best race we possibly can to win this. Well, it looks like you got a hell of a lot of support so far. Thank so you, congratulations. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm linking your your website uh, below in the description, and then all your social media will be linked, but just from you, how do people find you? 
Yeah, the biggest help, I mean, if anybody wants to support us, you can donate from any state, you can volunteer from any state, you can do it on starbuck2022.com. Um, there's a volunteer tab, you fill out your info, you can make phone calls for us and things along those lines. Keep in mind, this is a national race. So if I'm in there, even though I'm representing Tennessee, I'm also representing you nationally. I'm representing the voice of the people nationally for a movement that wants to put our country first again and our people first again. And so if you go there, you sign up or can make a donation, that's a huge help. Um, um, social obviously is fun, you know, if you want to follow along with like thoughts and insight and things along those lines. But that's the biggest help right now is volunteering. That human capital is so important to us because you help us reach people then within our district. Even if you're in Illinois or you're in California, you can make phone calls to people in our district and let them know what we're doing. And that helps build that name ID that we need to win. Perfect. Well, we'll be watching and good luck in 2022. And I really appreciate you. Thank you. I out. appreciate it. Cheers.